Good afternoon, everyone. So it is indeed my pleasure and honor to introduce Professor Will Stephan from the Australian National University of Climate Change Institute. Professor Stephan, his expertise is in climate change and earth system science. His interest is in the interaction between human action and the climate system. In fact, uh, as I was preparing for this talk uh, to introduce Professor Stephan, I learned something about Anthropocene. Well, uh, in the recent decade, I think human action has a lot of impact on the Earth system. I recall some time ago that uh, there's an advertisement where people are showing, putting up cards that say sorry to the Earth. This shows how human action has adversely impact the Earth where people start to say sorry to the Earth. So, well, this is an important thing because whatever do we do to the Earth has impact to our future generation. And I believe today, Professor Will Stephan is here to give us an important message. So without further ado, let us welcome Professor Will Stephan to deliver his talk on governing complexity in the Anthropocene. Let us welcome <laughs> Professor Will Stephan. Well, thanks very much, and thanks to all of you for sticking around uh, right to the end. I'm not going to talk so much about the complexity itself, as some of the previous speakers have done. They've given you some excellent insights from various aspects uh, of systems that show behavior uh, in terms of complex systems. What I want to talk about is how uh, we as a human society try to deal with this in matters that, that hit, the governance, uh, hit the governance sectors. And I'll, do, I'll, I'll, I'll focus this a lot on the climate change issue, although when I talk to governments in Australia and elsewhere, I focus on climate change. As a scientist, I focus on the Earth system. Climate is part of that, but it's only one part. So the concept, the framing concept I often use is this concept of the Anthropocene. Many of you have probably heard of it, uh, but I think to make sure that we're all on the, the same page, I'm going to make this a two-part talk with a little bit of an introduction here for the first 10 minutes or so on what the Anthropocene actually is. And second of all, then the bulk of the talk will be on the governance challenge. What does it mean that we are moving into a new geological epoch, uh, one that has characteristics that humans have never experienced since we've evolved on the planet? And that presents some really important governance challenges. So let's start then with the concept of the Anthropocene. That word has two parts, and it conjures up two things. The first part, the anthropo part, actually refers to us. It refers to humans and all the various things that humans do to make our way on the planet, to make our living on the planet. The last part of the term, the scene, uh, tells you that it's a geological sounding or geological type term. Things like Pleistocene and Eocene and Miocene. Those are terms that geologists use to describe periods in Earth history. And they, they do that because it's actually useful for their work. Now, I just want to preface this by saying there's a big debate now in the geological community because those of us who are not in it but are in areas that study the Earth in different ways have used this term so much now that we're actually forcing the geologists to think about formalizing it, which is raising all sorts of interesting questions in their community. One of the arguments is that they have to, they have to prove that it's actually a term that is useful. And, when I and I respond to that saying, useful for whom? It's already useful for a very large array of researchers who are not geologists. So our periods of Earth history, only the province of geologists, or of now have we moved truly into a new epoch that even sort of leaves the geologists behind a little bit. Well, let's go a little bit further into what we mean by the Anthropocene. And to do that, we do have to start with some science. This graph here is an ice core record for, from Antarctica. And it goes back nearly a half a million years in time, 420,000 years before present. 
It's got three, three lines on it. The red line is the one I'll focus on. That's a proxy for temperature, and it's a pretty good average for what was happening in terms of the global temperature, although it's amplified at the poles. We take this into account. But the important point to note is there's a very rhythmic pattern here, which is characteristic of a complex system. In fact, it's classic behavior of a complex system where you have two states. You have a warm state here, 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 and here. They're very short compared to the much longer cold states or ice ages in between. Now, you see a couple other things that are characteristic of a complex system. Irregularity, of course, in the phasing of the transition between a warm period and an ice age. And you also see limits. In other words, it looks like a limit cycle in terms of the ice ages always stop at the same lower temperature, and the warm periods always stop uh, very close to the same <coughs> upper temperature. Furthermore, you see that this complex system also has a very tight linkage between gas concentrations in the atmosphere. There's carbon dioxide in blue, methane in green, and temperature. It acts as a complex system with feedbacks in it. Now, for our purposes, when we start talking about governance, is this is the world that we humans have evolved in. This is the world that we know. Hominids have been around for two or three million years, we think, but fully modern humans arose sometime around 200, 250,000 years ago in Africa. And since that time, we have expanded in our geographic coverage and, of course, in our activity, as we heard in the last lecture. But the interesting thing is, for most of this period, up until this time here, we were hunter-gatherer societies only, no matter where we were. We didn't have much in the way of technology or very much in the way of complex societal organization. Now, notice that this last warm period here is longer than the previous three warm periods. And that's one of the hypotheses we have is this long warm period has allowed us to develop agriculture and then develop more complex societies and so on. Now, the geologists call this warm period here, which we're now about 12,000 years into, they call this the Holocene. So the debate now is whether we, have, we are leaving this period of the Holocene or this epoch and going into the new epoch. We can look at more detail if we take this last period of about 100,000 years when the Earth was just into the last ice age and then came out, we can look at that in more detail. And we go up to the other uh, pole. This is a Greenland ice core that goes back 100,000 years with a lot more detail. And you see that humanity suffered a very bumpy ride during the last ice age, uh, at least in the North Atlantic region, where this was most pronounced. Uh, tremendously sharp swings in temperature and then relaxation, sometimes up to 6 or 8 degrees Celsius in that North Atlantic region in a few decades. This is an enormous swing. It was muted elsewhere in the world, but the signal was there. But notice how when we came out of the last ice age, the last uh, glacial maximum was around 20,000 years ago. We came up here. And then we have this relatively stable uh, period of climate, at least in temperature. You had one excursion here about 8,000 or so years ago. It was a blip, again, a colder blip. But since then, we've hit sort of a planetary sweet spot in terms of how humanity can develop. So, Agriculture did not appear until we came out of the last ice age. And since that time, we developed civilizations in Africa, Asia, and of course, the, the ones that appeared later, the Greek, Roman, and so on in Europe. So this Holocene is the only geological <coughs> epoch that we know for sure that humanity can develop complex civilizations in. Now, we can't say for sure. We can't in other environmental or planetary states. But we don't know that for sure, because this is the only one we've actually been able to do it in. So the question now is, we are leaving the world of the Holocene, or so that's what many of us are man maintaining. And this is the world that we have come to know and love and thrive in. Now, the interesting thing is that this concept of the Anthropocene, of moving out of the Holocene into a new geological epoch, has spread actually quite rapidly outside of the scientific community. And you start to see it in popular publications. The first was the French. And the French being the French, they had to use sort of a culinary theme in describing how humanity was dealing with the planet. And then it came time for the Americans, and the Americans being the Americans, had to be bigger and better of everything. So you see a bit of culture, you see culture coming through in how people interpret the Anthropocene. So the French are a bit worried that we're eating away at the planet, whereas the US, are, are a lot of Americans sort of think, the good Anthropocene, this is great, we're in charge now. You know, let's forget about nature, we can just rebuild things and, and keep going. Um, and then, of course, you know that you've really made it in the outside world when the economists come into the picture. And so the economists then, about June last year after a meeting in London where the geologists got involved, 
sort of announced to the world, welcome to the Anthropocene. So it's, it, it's a concept that is being used, reinterpreted, spread around the planet. But there's some worrying signs of what the Anthropocene might mean. I'll show you some images just from the last two years from Australia. And those are images of extreme climatic events, which uh, some people are now starting to say with some confidence are outside the norms of the Holocene, even though Australia is, has arguably the most variable natural climate on the planet. Um, we're starting to see things we haven't seen before. Now, is this something we should expect as the climate shifts out of the Holocene? Well, possibly yes. And there's a big debate about that. We try to actually be much more uh, systematic, and so what we try to do is, as climate scientists is to go back in the more recent past, and when you're looking at geological epochs, the, the most recent past takes you back to the world of Sander and Co., the back of the Roman Empire, back here 200 AD, when we can try to uh, understand what the temperature might have been doing during the last 2,000 years. Now, there are a lot of different proxies. These are color-coded. Those are the scientific papers. They use tree rings. They use boreholes. They use sediments in lakes to look at the, like what the pollen might have been like and so on. So you can see a lot of variability in this record. You can see a rise through here. That's the so-called medieval warm period. And then you see a sharp decline. Uh, that's the Little Ice Age, which was very pronounced in Western Europe. If you go back to art museums in Western Europe, you can really see uh, a much colder period depicted in the paintings of that time. But this red line here is the instrumental record since the uh, mid to late 1800s. And we had uh, re reliable enough thermometers in enough places we could estimate global average temperature. And you see it's actually different from what went before it. The rate of change, we estimate, is greater than anything in the past. And now the higher temperature, this was 2000, 2010 is actually up, up in here somewhere, is outside even the error bars on the, on the proxy records just arising out of it over the last 2,000 years. So we have some evidence that, at least in terms of one metric of the climate system, one that people often look at, which is global average temperature, we are indeed leaving the Holocene. Now, if you go back in time, it's much harder to estimate what the Holocene temperature was. But the so-called mid-Holocene optimum, which some people call it, about six to 7,000 years before present, was probably up in here. It was close to where we are now. So there's a debate as, as to whether we're real, really outside the Holocene or not. But if we move away from climate, we clearly are. And we can look at other aspects of the Earth's system. We can look at the structure of the biosphere. Now, here's an example of the structure of the biosphere. This is the uh, marine ecosystem, the cod fishery off Newfoundland in the North Atlantic. We had records of the catch year by year from 1850. And you can see it was crawling up with interannual variability. But then you see an enormous spike after the Second World War up here. And I'm going to return to the post-World War II world, because that's really a break point in how humanity has developed. And then you see a big crash. And then you see a little bit of a rise, a little bit of recovery. And then you see a crash to virtually zero around 1990, 1992. Now, I marked 92. That's when the first institutional governance response occurred. Now, this, this reinforces what, what Brian Arthur just said, is that the institutional governance response comes late, typically. So even though we had an enormous crash, already down here we're below the long-term average. But still, we didn't put no regulations whatsoever in, maybe hoping the problem would go away. And then after the complete crash, the regulations came in. All right, so that now we're moving at least that ecosystem outside of its Holocene norm. We can look at land ecosystems, and we're terrestrial creatures, so we spend much more of our time on land than we do out in the sea. And you can see we've remade entire landscapes. We've cleaned up this river and made it nice and smooth, and we've made everything in neat rows as far as the eye can see. And this has happened in quite a few areas around the planet. That's the landscape scale. We can go right down to the genetic scale, and we're even improving the breakfast uh, food that you might have. So in fact, from genes to landscapes, we're making over planet Earth. Again, this is outside the Holocene. These, these sort of genetic materials did not occur in the Holocene. These sort of landscapes did not occur in the Holocene. So we use the term global change rather than climate change to describe this. And we, again, we can try to systematize what global change really looks like in the Anthropocene. We can look at the big element cycles. This is the nitrogen cycle. This is pre-industrial. That's post-industrial. Now, you don't have to go through that system in great detail. All you need to know is that there's one whacking great error which draws the system. And that's the fixation of nitrogen, uh, unreactive nitrogen from the atmosphere by leguminous plants. Right? That's done naturally. And then it, then it cycles all the way through the system. Now, this even greater error here is what humans are doing. 
That is industrial fixation of nitrogen by the Haber-Bosch process after the Industrial Revolution in the late 1800s. Now, that's allowed an explosion of the human population. We would be nowhere near 7 billion without this branch of the nitrogen cycle, which provides fertilizer to support agriculture around the world. Okay, so we have remade the nitrogen cycle. And then it, then it has knock-on effects all the way through the nitrogen cycle. More nit nitrous oxide in the atmosphere, more eutrophication of lakes, dead zones in the ocean, and so on, which are at least partly attributable to more nit reactive nitrogen in the Earth's system. Again, way outside the bounds of the Holocene. We can look at the hydrological cycle. These red dots are where large dams have been built around the world to co-opt fresh water for human use. Primarily, 70% for agriculture, some for industry, some for personal use. But if you look at here, all the large rivers in the world, even here in Australia, the driest continent on the planet outside of Antarctica, have been dammed apart from a few big ones in Siberia. Those are the only ones that are flowing free to the ocean. Again, way outside the bounds of the Holocene. I mentioned landscapes. Well, these areas are, that are, are, are colored in here are areas where cultivated systems dominate those landscapes. Now, obviously, we need to feed 7 billion people. So you see the really fertile lands in, in eastern US, western Europe, into Ukraine, and so on, India and China, have really already been used. Uh, the areas where you don't see much, of course, are too dry here, here, or too cold here, here, although agriculture is already moving up here as the climate warms. Again, this is way outside the anthropocene envelope of grasslands or savannas, which is what most of these have been converted into for cropping and some cropping grazing systems. And then, of course, we look at the climate. Um, some of the things we see here are now massive storms. This is Cyclone Yasi coming in on the east coast of Australia. That, uh, that storm system is about uh, approaching the size of half the size of the entire continent. So it's a big system. Uh, and of course, we have the iconic uh, surface air temperature Map. This goes out to 2011. And again, you see a lot of interannual variability, but since the mid 20th century, the trend is really clear. It's warming and it's warming at a rapid rate. So all of these are pieces of evidence that we're out of the Holocene now. We're into something new and something different, something that's largely been driven by human activities and something that's putting us into terra incognita, a type of global environment we haven't experienced. So we tried to systemize this in, in terms of the human enterprise what's driving this, and in terms of the, uh, the, the global implications. So what we tried to do here, this was work carried out really about a decade ago and published in 2004, was to take the same time frame, 1750, so we picked up just before the Industrial Revolution, out to the year 2000. And whatever parameter we have here, we did it in linear, not logarithmic. So you really see the effect of these changes. So this is what we call the human enterprise, some basics. Here's population, here's economic activity foreign direct investment. So you see things rising. You see some things didn't really exist much before 1950, particularly true in terms of communication down here where you see motor vehicles, telephones, and here you see international tourism. Um, we used McDonald restaurants. You might be amused by that. That was actually a very good indicator for globalization, as good as we could find. And then, of course, the resource use, fertilizers. I mentioned water, damming of rivers, and so on. But look at the year 1950. 1950 was a breakpoint in how the human enterprise developed. Where we already had activity like population, the slope increased. But in many of these things we take for granted in our lifetimes, they really didn't exist much, like foreign direct investment or international tourism uh, or motor vehicles or McDonald's and so on. Now, I could give you a, a lecture, probably Sandra or others could give, give you a more professional lecture on why things changed socioeconomically after the Second World War. But it had to do with breaking down of old institutions, which were holding things back, uh, the movement of an enormous amount of science and technologists into the civil economy after the war effort. Uh, and they were better able to put these blocks together that, that Brian was telling us about. And connectivity networks in terms of moving finance, moving ideas, moving people, moving material. But when you add all that up, you get a very interesting, very interesting picture. Now, this, this little. Um, very simple image I like from National Geographic. It uses this iPad identity, which a lot of people complain about. It's very simple. But at the global aggregate, it's not bad. It means the impact on the Earth system is equal to the population aggregated by affluence and technology. Uh, and this is not to be purely multiplied. It's just that you aggregate them in some way. 
if I was mathematically more rigorous, I would have said it's a function of blah, blah, blah. The public doesn't understand that, that symbology or its symbolism very well. Anyway, so what National Geographic has done is said, all right, let's make a three-sided figure, a box, and let's have each axis represent one of those. So population is this orangey thing coming out. Technology, which they use the indicator, number of patents. Um, and then you have affluence, which is uh, uh, economic uh, uh, GDP. Uh, and if you see the box, it's filled with stuff like airplanes and refrigerators and cars and so on. Now, this little tiny wedge you can barely see in here, that's 1900. Okay? That's a bit over 100 years ago, a little over a century ago. Now, the next 50 years, 1950, is this little wedge. Okay? Now, the rest of it is 1950 to 2010, 2011. It's what we call the Great Acceleration, an enormous explosion of human activity. And this is really what's driving the Anthropocene. There's still good evidence that in 1950 we hadn't left the Anthropocene envelope, but we certainly did afterwards. And we tried to capture that uh, in terms of the same type of diagram I showed you, but now looking at the Earth system and how has it changed in the same time period that this human explosion has occurred. And so you see here the three famous greenhouse gases, that CO2, nitrous oxide, methane. You see how they've risen. This is ozone depletion, stratospheric ozone depletion from CFCs. There's the Northern Hemisphere temperature record. Uh, the number of larger great floods is increasing. And then these last six are, 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 are direct impacts on ecosystems, on ocean ecosystems, coastal, and then the terrestrial, the, the, the loss of forests and woodlands in the tropics, the amount of domesticated land, that's land that's been made over by us, and extinction rate going up. So you can make a cogent argument and that in almost all of these cases these parameters are now outside the envelope in which they wiggled or varied during the Holocene. So again, we're putting together a very strong case that in fact the global environment looked at in its totality is now shifting into a new state, a state we call the Anthropocene. Uh, and I'll get back to that, uh, what that means in terms of complex systems in a moment because it's a concept that's not often understood or used by people in the governance or institutional sector who still have this feeling of a perturbation on the Holocene that the Earth will relax back to if we just learn to live with it a bit better. I think it's a bit deeper than that. So let's turn to, to, to part two of the talk, which is what is the complexity challenge in terms of governance and institutions. There's a lot of things I could talk about. Oren Young and I wrote a paper on this in 2009, if you want to, to read a little bit more of our thinking. Uh, but I just want to pull out three things that we talked about, which are characteristic. One is dealing with uncertainties. The Earth is indeed a complex system. A lot of people talk about Earth systems, uh, which is true, they're subsystems. But even what a lot of scientists fail to recognize is that the Earth as a whole is a system. So I prefer to use the Earth as a complex system itself. And of course, it's not entirely deterministic like any complex system, uh, despite the fact that many climate scientists, my colleagues, you got to be careful to, to say this in the right company, still think it's somewhat deterministic. There are intrinsic uncertainties that will remain, even with perfect models or perfect understanding. That's the nature of a complex system. Hard for governance to deal with that. Capacity to assimilate new information. I'll give you a little vignette in a moment about that. But we're continually producing new knowledge about global change, especially about risk to societies and natural ecosystems. And people, and, and, and people in the governance sector have trouble having to recalibrate and recalibrate. You told me last year that, blah, 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 and so on. The last one's really tricky. Early warning systems. Dealing with thresholds and abrupt change. Governance is not good with dealing with this. They like linear systems. They like systems where they see a pressure, they see a response, and they know how to do with it. They don't like to see systems where you see pressure, you see nothing happen, you see more pressure, everything's fine, you see a little bit more pressure, and the whole system tips over to another state. They have a lot of trouble with that, so I'll focus a bit more on that last one. Let's talk about some uncertainties then. I'll start with my own continent. And water is an ever important issue for Australians, and we've seen some trends in this map, trends since 1970 uh, up until 2010. The brown areas are where it's getting drier, the green areas are getting wetter. If I told any of my countrymen that Australia was actually getting wetter, they would laugh at me. How could that possibly be? Well, that's because virtually nobody lives out here. But it is getting wetter. Uh, and if you average over the whole continent, in fact, it's gotten a bit wetter. Now, the question is, particularly for people who have to manage this, should we build another dam? Should we build a desal plant? Very costly, but what should we do? Is this related to climate change? All right, here's where it gets tricky. It's only here we have strong evidence that there's actually a climate change signal. We don't have particularly strong evidence here. We have some, and it's related to the same phenomenon that's hitting this one. But up here in Queensland, where they're just uh, wildly oscillating now between really dry periods and violent rain, 
Uh, they're saying, what are we going to do about this? Do we fundamentally change our infrastructure to deal with it? Or is this a part of long-term natural variability and will it relax back? Now, the, the science simply isn't clear at all on that. It's just too tricky because the modes of national, natural variability are very strong and very intense. And we in the scientific community are debating, even today, about what we see in terms of floods and droughts. Is there a climate change signal or isn't there? Governance has a, big big, a, a lot of trouble handling this. Switch to the northern hemisphere. This northern branch of the circulation, North Atlantic circulation, there you see um, North America, there you see Europe. This is during the last ice age where you have ice down North America. There's the Fennoscandian <coughs> ice sheet. But those big swings I showed you in that Greenland ice core resulted from this. This is the stable state. And then apparently with some very, very subtle solar triggering, this red surface current pushes its way up to around Greenland and Iceland and causes a big temperature rise around six or seven degrees. And there you see it propagating out. And then it relaxes back down and does that uh, repeatedly. But the, the question is, when you put a lot of fresh water onto the system, uh, you can trigger this state, which is the warm state, dropping back down there. And that's the concern in Northern Europe is we start to melt Greenland, shove fresh water onto the North Atlantic. We will cause that circulation to retreat southwards and put an ice box around Northern Europe while the rest of the planet warms. That's a very tricky issue. And the question that I got asked when I was working in Stockholm was, how likely is this? Could this occur in the next 50, 100 years? The answer is probably not, but it's certainly not zero probability. Again, something that, that policymakers have difficulty handling with. That's the climate system. It gets even worse when you talk about biological systems. Here's an estimate of what's happening to biological diversity. So here we have the distant past, fossil record, recent past, and the future. This logarithmic scale is extinction rate. It's extinction rate of mammal species. And you can see the rate here estimated somewhere between 0.1 and 1. For every 1,000 mammal species, one would go extinct every millennium. So that's basically what that scale is. That's a natural rate of species going extinct. Right now, we're 100 times over that, not due to climate, but mainly due to land use change, hunting, other human pressures. We're expected to go another 10 to 100 times over that this century due to continuing pressure on landscapes as we have more people they need to eat and as climate starts to shift ever more. Now, why is this really important? Well, ethically it's important, but it's also practically important because when you look at this concept of ecosystem services, the goods and services we derive from ecosystems around the world, you can look at all this, this very nice um, categorization by the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, but look what sits underneath it, that. That is the underpinning for the ecosystem services on which we depend. Now here, science is really weak. We simply don't know how much biodiversity or ecological complexity, which is a better term, how much ecological complexity can you lose of what types before you really start affecting the provision of these services, which you can read over here, they have direct implications for our own well-being. A big lack of knowledge. So how do you advise a policymaker who says, all right, well, we can convert this and do that. And the conservation groups say, wait a minute, you're going to lose biodiversity. Well, you've got to be, to be able to tell a convincing story that that actually matters, that you lose biodiversity. And we can't do that yet. Vast uncertainty. There's uncertainty on the human side of the Earth system. Here's the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment storylines or scenarios. We don't know how we're going to develop as a society. And that's clear from the previous presentations, that there's an internal dynamic that is hard to predict. Few of us could predict. Um, well, I was born just before, just at the start of the Great Acceleration. I could have never predicted where, where we are now in, in 2012. But here are some different types of societies. Global orchestration, order from strength. Just from the title, you can sort of picture what those societies look like. And there are two more here you can see um, there. Adapting mosaic techno garden, or a mix of these. Depending on which way we go, will have a big impact on how the Earth system as a whole goes, because we're an intricate part of the Earth system. And there's big uncertainty around that, too. So dealing with that when you're trying to make decisions is really difficult. Second point is assimilating new knowledge. There's a nice little story I'd like to tell you here. This is what's called the famous burning embers diagram. It was a, a brainchild of John Schellendorfer from the Potsdam Institute. And John put this in the third assessment report, not the fourth, the third, third assessment report, 2001, of the IPCC, reasons for concern that the climate is shifting. 
And so you can read what this says, risk to unique ecosystems, extreme weather, distribution, in other words, uh, are the impacts going to be mainly on the poor countries or, or the wealthy countries, and so on. And then these risks of very large-scale discontinuities, and I'll talk about those in a moment. But the red means much higher risk, and the white means low or no risk, and that's a temperature scale as we go up. Now, the zero is a little bit confusing because the zero is where they were at. It's actually the 1961 to 1990 average. The 1990 average. Now, we'd already risen six-tenths of a degree by that point. So this is the pre-industrial. That's why the minus 0.6 is there. This is pre-industrial. This is where we're at late 20th century. We're up about here now, and that's the projections of where we could go. Now, policymakers looked at that, and we had a lot of discussions amongst policy pe uh, people and the climate community and came up with the so-called two-degree guardrail, which is you're going to cop some impacts, but you can avoid the worst of it. So we put that two-degree guardrail in. Now that two-degree guardrail is this six-tenths plus 1.4. That's why you get to this, th that position. Now that means you're going to lose some, some ecosystems, have some impacts. You're going to have some more extreme weather, but you have a very, very low probability you'll trigger these big con discontinuities I'll talk about. That got widely accepted in the EU and then globally signed up to. Our, our government in Australia signed up to it. This is the target that governments want to, to meet. They want to limit the temperature rise to no more than two degrees. So here we go, 2009 now. There was an update of that. And the update looked like this. New knowledge. Doesn't look so good, does it? It's coloring all the way through here. Now, of course, most policymakers don't read the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and probably some of their advisors don't. So we come up to Co Copenhagen which was December 2009. This had just been published. And here's a panel, a uh, panel discussion. Uh, we have an eminent politician. That was the prime minister of Denmark at the time. There's uh, Nick Stern. There's Dan Kamen, who's an energy expert. There's Stefan Romstorff from PIC, and there's me on the end. And Stefan brought up this point of, well, two degrees really isn't safe. You know, new knowledge says we should really cap it at 1.5. Now, he exploded. He said, you've been telling me all these years it's two degrees. We've been planning on two degrees. Now you guys come back and say it's 1.5. What are you going to do tomorrow? Say it's going to be minus something. You know, he, just, he just exploded, saying, we can't cope with this. And see, this is a problem for, for people who, who have dealt with the scientific knowledge, come up with a consensus that may have been a compromise. Most scientists weren't terribly comfortable with two degrees. And then new knowledge comes along, and he's confronted with this, and he has trouble handling it. There's other new knowledge along the way coming out, too. Uh, one of them, and now we're moving on to some of these big, large discontinuities that I'll focus on a little bit later. You can probably see the outline there. That's the Greenland ice sheet. And there's concern that if we lose a portion of that or all of that, we'll have a big hit for sea level rise. We'll be talking about meters of sea level rise, obviously important for Singapore and countries like that. So we look at this map, and these are some, some measurements of where we're losing ice in terms of mass. That's the red orange. And where we're gaining ice, which is the blue, and it's snowing more. And we're getting two types of measurements that's estimating what's going, going on. One is called satellite altimetry. That's this one, which measures very subtle changes in the altitude around the Earth. So we can see that it's gaining altitude here, losing there. The second one, I think, is even, even more cunning, and that's a gravimetric measurement. It's called GRACE satellites. Uh, and those satellites can measure very subtle changes in the Earth's gravitational field uh, on, on a regional basis. So they can tell whether the, how the gravitational field of this ice mass is changing and it's changing toward losing mass. And so these measurements are consistent. If we go from 1990 out to 2008 or 9, you see that the curve, if you look at a curve through there, it's going sharply downwards. Uh, so that's losing uh, ice at the rate of about 200 cubic kilometers per year at the moment. It's now making a significant contribution to sea level rise. But the question is, can that get to sort of a runaway effect where you cross the threshold and you're basically committed to losing the whole thing? The question then becomes, how fast could that happen? We have no good answer to that. Other new knowledge that's becoming uh, interesting to assimilate, and this is knowledge that just came in the last year or so, uh, two. This, if you see this little inset, that's Antarctica. This is East Antarctica. This was thought to be the most stable of any of the large ice sheets. Um, this is, uh, this in fact, is the Australian Territory, and here I was down there last month to, um, actually just down here, this is the Casey Station. What these are, are these are flights by an aircraft fanning out like this. And they're using lasers to look down through the ice, which is a couple kilometers thick, to see where the ground actually is, or to see where the rock bed actually is. Now, the problem here is 
East Antarctica was thought to be grounded, the ice grounded on land above sea level. We find now as we go in from Casey, which is just, just here, all these light colors are below sea level. So there's a fair bit of ice that's actually grounded below sea level, just like the West Antarctic ice sheet. So if this is replicated, we have a serious problem in that we have a lot more ice that's vulnerable than we thought before. So these, this is new knowledge, uh, which is yet to be assimilated into the, into the policy arena, into the governance arena, but is really going to be tricky to handle. And that really brings me to the theme then of this early warning systems uh, and this idea that some of the subsystems of the Earth system, many of them, are not linear by any sense. They show complex system behavior in their own right in terms of having thresholds and abrupt changes to a new state. Now again, John Schellenuber and colleagues have done a nice job of trying to summarize what some of these are. You can read them. They basically have to do with ice. So here you see ice here and here. And they have to do um, with land change, methane outbursts from permafrost, Amazon, Sahara. Uh, and you have to do with atmospheric change here, Indian monsoon transformation, ENSO triggering, and so on. So they tried to make an estimate of where the most, vulnerability, most vulnerable of those were. And you can see a sample of five of them here and the warming level that it might take to trigger them. Now, this is starting to get to things that policy people would read. You see, here's the two-degree guardrail. Well, there's a risk we could actually lose the Greenland ice sheet. It may take a long time, but we could lose it at two degrees. The Indian summer monsoon is interesting because a billion people depend on the regularity of that for food. We've known it can flip in one year to a very dry uh, situation leading to starvation. But we don't know for sure what triggers those. We've seen it in the, in the record of the past. So again, this makes decision makers exceptionally nervous, uh, but it's something that we, we simply have too many uncertainties around. And here you have three to four degrees. This is the Gulf Stream I was talking about earlier, Amazon rainforest, maybe the West Antarctic ice sheet. And you see the impacts. Again, this is what the policy people are, are really concerned about. And the problem I think we face is that there is a tacit assumption, even in the climate research community, even in the expert community, that basically uh, what this system is going to do is if we get our emissions under control, which is the top bit, we'll cap temperature at 2 degrees. If we don't, it'll go up to 5 or 6 or 7. But even if you look beyond 2100, all the scenarios that I've seen assume a long, steady uh, relaxation into a Holocene state. In other words, this is a perturbation, albeit a really big perturbation, into a, Holoc into a, a new temporary state back to the Holocene. But the problem is all of those, none of those models are actually complex. They can't, they can't generate complex systems behavior. They're deterministic models, the big GCMs. And so because they're parameterized for the Holocene as the base state, they eventually come back to that when things work through the system. Uh, and that's something then that we're going to challenge a little bit. And again, John Schellenuber took the lead in challenging this by having a look at this in more detail and saying, all right, these things are not independent. They're part of the Earth system. They're linked. Uh, most of them are affected by temperature and they're affected by each other. So let's just take some hypothetical linkages, and that's what he did. So you start now with the, uh, the Earth system. And we'll start something uh, close to home, as far as I'm concerned, which is ENSO triggering. And you start really changing the behavior of their ENSO system. Say so it locks into a La Nina uh, for a long time, which it has the last couple years, or vice versa. It doesn't oscillate. Well, that triggers something else. It transformed the Indian monsoon. Those are linked. You can see that quite clearly in the paleo record. So this could be one of the things that triggers a sharp change there. Well, the Indian monsoon obviously is uh, related to Tibetan albedo change. That has to do with the snow that falls on the Tibetan plateau. And that tells you whether it's a dark or a light surface which reflects uh, sunlight. And of course, that's directly related to the behavior of the Indian monsoon. That's where the moisture comes from. So those are all linked. And we know that quite clearly. Then we have some other interesting linkages. What happens in the Indian Ocean is actually linked to the Saharan vegetation this waxing and waning of the Sahara and the Sahel. And it's also linked to a thing called the Bodelli uh, Depression, which is a very dry area here. And that's a, a large source of dust for the Atlantic Ocean, which actually fertilizes, by the way, uh, a lot of the marine uh, ecosystems through provision of iron. It also has a link to the Amazon rainforest, which is interesting, too. It does, uh, ironically, provide some phosphorus to the uh, Amazon rainforest through these big dust storms that come across in the right amounts, but too much dust storm and it starts smothering the Amazon rainforest and causes dieback. So you have a, a very complex relationship between what happens in the Sahara 
and what happens in the Amazon. And then we can look at the other direction because ENSO operates all across the Pacific Ocean. And so you see an arrow coming in here. Uh, it changes the marine pump, carbon pump. That's the upwelling off Peru. And it also affects rainfall in the Amazon. So here you have a complex series of subsystems which could actually trigger each other and act together to sort of shift, shift things around the planet. Now we can do one other thought experience, experiment. It's a little bit shorter. Let's start with the ice. So we can start with the instability of the West Antarctic ice sheet and Greenland. They're both around 2, 3, 4 degrees. So let's say we lose both of those or, or, or much of those. Well, we know for sure we're going to affect the circulation around there, the Southern Ocean upwelling, uh, and we're going to affect the North Atlantic. So we put the North Atlantic in there. Now, if you change deep water formation and upwelling here, there's absolutely no doubt that the circulation is going to be changed right down the Atlantic Ocean. Of course, that's part of the conveyor belt. That's going to then be a linkage here. Go up, I'll get the other one, sorry. It's going to destabilize some, some hydrates up here, uh, release some methane, and that, then it's going to um, change the ocean circulation, the Indian Ocean, which will change the monsoon, and of course, that triggers the rest of the lot. Now, you look at this and say, wow, is that just fanciful thinking? Well, fact, no. If you think about it in terms of complex system, all it's saying is that if you push the Earth system far enough, these things will act in concert to shift into a new state. And that's really what we're talking about here. This is trying to give you some of the detail and some of the sequencing of how this might actually happen. So now let's go back then again to my original idea of the Earth as a complex system and the idea of the Anthropocene. So this is going back much deeper in time. You don't need to go back all the way to 60 million years ago, only to see that uh, this is temperature in each case, that the Earth has been much warmer and it's been on a long-term cooling trend. But the interesting thing here is the last three million years, the years of the hominids. This is the years, years that we've been on the planet. And it's this last little bit here. It's called the quaternary cooling. Again, you see an oscillation between warm and cold periods. But look how different it is earlier. It's what the geologists call the 40,000 world. That's a 40,000 year periodicity. And look at the swings aren't so violent or not so large between warm periods and cold periods. But look at our, our period here. In fact, one hypothesis for the evolution of our big brain is that we've had to deal with a much more erratic and difficult climate than our hominid ancestors had to do. I don't know whether there's any truth in that, but some people maintain that might be part of the evolutionary driving force for a large brain. But anyway, there's a really interesting phenomenon here. Somewhere around here, the system flips between a 40K world and a 100K world, and it oscillates much more wildly between ice ages and warm periods. Now, if you go to some of Martin Sheffer's work on complex systems, you can get a hint at what might be happening here that these 40 and 100,000 year periods are, are, are phased by the orbit of the Earth around the sun. So there's very subtle triggering of differences in solar insulation. But probably what's happening here is what we call phase locking, that the time it takes for those big northern ice sheets to wax and wane grows as they get bigger. So as they get bigger, they may reach a point where they lock in in terms of their phase with 100,000 year rather than the 40,000 year solar forcing. And we get this phase locking that gets us into this pattern here. So this is, a, this is a, again, looking at the Earth as a complex system. So here we are now, the last 60,000 years, just in here. And there you see the Holocene appearing. And there you see a long-term record of the Holocene, the last, last 12,000 years, with a contemporary warming of about a degree, which does appear in this uh, reconstruction to be higher than anything else during the Holocene. So now, again, we just very quickly return to this diagram I showed you earlier, where, again, here you see that that phase locking at about 100K. Here you see the close link between CO2 and temperature, between methane and CO2 and temperature. So it very much looks like a complex system. So you could argue then that using this, this little um, valley bowl and valley diagram uh, of, of a complex system that has a couple of states, that you can force this system past a bifurcation point and it rolls or settles into another system. You could argue that it's been doing that at 100,000-year intervals between ice ages and warm periods. But what we're doing now is we're actually pushing the system in a different direction. In other words, we're going outside that limit cycle. If you, if you look at the, the limits, if we go back one here, and you look at the limits now, that temperature always settles to the same lower level, an ice age always rises to within a degree same upper level, same with CO2. So whatever powerful feedbacks there are that, that, that really propel the Earth between those systems, the sun only triggers it. 
Solar insulation is not nearly enough to drive it. It only triggers it. It paces it. So the internal dynamics of the Earth system, I should just add here, the two major ones that drive the slide down here and the rise are two feedback loops that work in reverse. One's called an albedo feedback loop, uh, which is the big ice sheets and the northern hemisphere vegetation, uh, which act in concert. As the ice sheet retreats in the north, it's replaced by vegetation, which grows better as the climate warms, greens up. All that absorbs more sunlight, enhances the heating. The other big feedback mechanism is a greenhouse gas one, uh, primarily CO2. As the oceans start to warm, they outgas CO2 because it's less soluble in warm water than it is in cold. And as you get more CO2, as you're coming out of an ice age, they come out very quickly. That intensifies the warming more. And vice versa when you go into an ice age. Now, we don't know for sure yet what actually caps these big feedback mechanisms where they do. Whatever it is, it's systematic of a complex system. So there's our limit cycle. Now, what we can do is look at it in this little cartoon where, say, as the Earth is in an ice age and the sun triggers, just starts to um, make that valley less deep, then you get those feedback mechanisms to make it less deep, and then it rolls into an interglacier. But we can also use that same analogy to look at the direction we're going now. And the way to look at it is, is this way, is that here's the CO2 I just showed you from 420,000 years ago to the present. Never goes above 300, never goes below 180. That's its, its limit cycle. This is the additional CO2. We're approaching 400 parts per million. And we've put that in basically most of it since 1950. 1950, we're only a bit above 300. So most of it's post-1950. Now, this has already more than doubled the operating range between an ice age and a warm period. So we're, we've really broken the CO2 out of the limit cycle in a very big way. We know it's really important for the energy balance of the Earth. Uh, that's basic physics. So the concern is, what's that going to do to the, planet, to the climate part? And this is a way you can, you, you can visualize that by going back 1,000 years and looking at natural variability of, of northern hemisphere temperature. Here's where we are today. I sort of showed you that earlier. But that, on the same time scale, is what the IPCC projections are from an additional 1.4 to 5.8 degrees Celsius. So you see now that the difference between, by the way, the difference between an ice age and a warm period is about five degrees in global average temperature. So the projections for one century, not, not, not a five or 10,000 year transition, which is the transition between an ice age and a warm period, but a one century transition may be as high as four or five degrees. And so we're, we're committed to about this. My guess is if we go up here, it'll be very difficult for modern civilization to survive that. It's too much, too fast. Ecosystem services will collapse. Um, we'll have all sorts of extreme events and so on. But from a complex systems point of view, this is really telling you something. We've already pushed the CO2 way outside of its limit cycle. We're starting to push temperature, which is a measure of the, the, the imbalance of the Earth's energy, surface energy system. We're starting to put that, push that outside of the limit cycle. So there's another way of looking then at the Anthropocene, which is, let's look now at this at the Holocene. The Ice Age is somewhere down below. And now this is the nascent Anthropocene. It sits up here. Some other state of the Earth system that we could access hasn't been accessed for a long, long time, but it might be there. And now here's some pre-Anthropocene events. We did some early agriculture. We did fiddle around with the Earth system, weakened the stability domain here a little bit. Now we have the great acceleration. We're just flattening this out and pushing it. And now we are starting to slide down into the Anthropocene as a new, perhaps long-term, epoch in Earth history. So that's really the question we face. To close, I want to go back to the statement I made right at the beginning. And that is, let's bring this now back from sort of a theoretical complex systems point of view to something more directly uh, of importance to humans. That is, the Holocene is the only state we know for sure that we can thrive in. So let's make a normative judgment that we want to stay in that state or something close to that state to make sure that we can continue to develop. So that motivated a, a piece of work that was published in 2009 called the planetary boundaries, which is a, a scientist's view of, all right, if you make a normative judgment, if you make a normative judgment that you want to stay close to the Holocene, what would you have to do to do that? What would the global environment actually look like? So this was published in Nature. You can see we got together quite a group of people to try to, to, to put this together. You might see some familiar names on that list of people. But um, the idea was to say, What's the minimum number of parameters or processes 
or pieces of structure of the Earth system we really need to look after. And we came up with nine of them. Obviously, climate was one. Ozone was another. Aerosols was another. We think they're really important for how the atmosphere operates. Uh, aerosols are small particles. You would know them as air pollution when you see a hazy day over Los Angeles or Sydney or Beijing. That's aerosol. Ocean acidification. Global freshwater use, we talked about that. Chemical pollution. All the new chemicals, uh, the so-called POPs, persistent organic pollutants, radionuclides, now pervasive in the environment. Land system change, rate of biodiversity loss, and the big nitrogen and phosphorus cycles. Now, we even tried to quantify those. And the quantification looks like that. So a couple of them we couldn't even guess. Chemical pollution and aerosols were too hard. But what we did is try to come up with hard numbers that might be of value to policy people, institutional people. Climate change, we actually opted for 350 parts per million. We're already at 390. So it tells you we're already over what we think is the limit to stay within the Holocene. Now, we tried to estimate our state of knowledge. Here, we know a lot about the climate system. So knowledge is good, but there is debate on this boundary position. So it should be 350, 450, 550, 500, whatever. The more fundamental one is changing the Earth's energy balance by no more than one watt per square meter. We think that's what we need to do to ensure we stay in the Holocene. You can see uh, others, 20% reduction over the pre-industrial ocean state in terms of the saturation ratio for aragonite and so on. Now, the P and N cycles, we said 35 teragrams of nitrogen per year is the maximum we should fix and put into the system before we start changing that and so on. So you can see with all, all of these. Now, the question is, all right, those are nice numbers, but what do they mean in terms of where we are vis-a-vis -vis the boundaries? Well, we did that too. And there's, I think, a nice catchy diagram that we published in 2009 where this green circle is the safe operating space. If humanity is inside that, it can continue to develop its economy, its technology, and all sorts of different directions, and be assured of staying within the Holocene uh, geological epoch. But if it starts going beyond that, there is no guarantee that we can keep the Earth in that state. The Earth as a system may flip to another state, which uh, possibly will be called the Anthropocene, or maybe even something else when we get there. So of those nine, we've been able to quantify seven of them, and these two that don't have quantification, we just haven't been able to do yet. But the interesting thing is everyone's worried about climate change. And indeed, we're outside of the boundary in terms of climate change. We're way outside of the boundary in terms of nitrogen. And some people have already argued that we've underestimated this and we should be outside in terms of phosphorus. But the thing that really gains a lot of attention is this one. Biodiversity loss is way outside what we think we need to maintain to stay in the Holocene state. There's also a huge uncertainty of knowledge around that boundary. We don't even know whether extinction rate is the best indicator. Are there other more subtle indicators uh, that we could use and so on? This has generated a lot of debate. It's ge generated debate in the scientific community. A lot of scientists uh, have really questioned about how can you put numbers on things like biodiversity loss and so on. We thought we'd have a first crack at that. Now, the policy community is interesting. Uh, this was picked up by the um, UN panel or uh, Ban Ki-moon's panel on global sustainability. It just released a report that's going into the Rio plus 20. The tension that this sort of thinking causes became clear in that report because it's been viewed by many developing countries as another way for the wealthy countries to cap development by saying, you've got to stay within these boundaries. That means we can't develop like you guys develop, and therefore you get that tension. You see that tension being played out in the climate change issue and so on. Interestingly, the person who actually really picked this up and ran with it was Kevin Rudd, who until very recently was the the foreign minister for Australia, previous prime minister, who was on Ban Ki-moon's panel. So, um, and I know his chief advisor really well. In fact, he's an adjunct professor with my group. So I had some real inside knowledge as to what was actually going on on that, on that panel. And it's interesting how, again, here's an example of how complex systems thinking really challenges uh, well-set uh, well positions out there in, in, in the policy and, and institutional governance communities. So I've nearly consumed my hour. It's very late in the day. So I'm going to stop there and just leave you with, I think, the most telling image of the Earth as a single system. And I'll open it up for questions and discussion.
Great. Uh, th thanks a lot. I, I just like to get your comment on the whole concept of sort of geoengineering, which oh. is sort of you know the quick technological fix to get us out of this, and, and, and what do yeah. you have to say about that? Well, first of all, all, all the geoengineering approaches I've seen go nowhere near meeting the nine planetary boundaries simultaneously. Let's give you an example. Uh, and the most commonly talked one is putting uh, stratospheric aerosols up there to cool the climate. Now, we know that that, that's a, that can happen because whenever you get a big volcanic eruption, you get a dip in the temperature for a couple of years. The, the process is well known. However, what you don't know is, uh, or what you don't know is how that's going to change rainfall patterns. Okay? We know that it does. There was some evidence that they changed after uh, Pinatubo. So what that means is, however we do our agriculture, we'll have to shift dramatically. Also, you get less sunlight in for growing crops and so on. Another problem is you have to continuously put up those aerosols. They're rained out reasonably quickly. So you have to make sure you can ensure institutional governance stability globally for a long period of time. Because if you use that and you continually pump up CO2, you have a ticking time bomb. Because as soon as you release those aerosol cooling for some reason, whether it's a breakdown in, in institutional governance or you're, you run out of rocket fuel or whatever happens, you've got a massive warming sitting there in the atmosphere. And then the other planetary boundaries, ocean acidification. You actually accelerate ocean acidification by taking the lid off fossil fuel combustion and saying, oh, we don't have to worry about fossil fuels because we can put aerosols up there. Well, you've just basically sentenced most marine ecosystems uh, to an early demise. So that's the one that's most commonly talked about. Others are even more fanciful. The basic fundamental thing is I don't think we know enough about how that complex system operates to fiddle with it at the planetary scale and think we'll get away with it, OK? I was wondering if uh, working out scenarios for 2050, 2100, if you did a mock-up of that chart that you showed, the current situation, I would assume it would be unbelievably frightening along the lines of your that 12-panel 12, that 12 graph? Yeah. Yeah, in, in some it would in terms of temperature, gas concentration. Others were actually listed as percentages. I didn't go through those in detail. Like the percentage of fisheries fully exploited. Well, you can only hit 100. Um, and I, I suspect we won't hit 100. We'll, we'll sit below that because we're learning how to manage those better. So I think when we update those, those graphs on the, the, the global impact, you'll see a mix depending on what the impact is and how we've portrayed it uh, on there. We're trying to update them, by the way, up to 2010 or 11. Uh, and the, the ones on the human enterprise are fascinating. Um, if, if you look at a couple of them, if you look at the development of two things, population and global GDP from uh, 1990, 2000 to 2010, obviously by 2010, the big Asian economies are kicking in, India, China, and so on. But it's surprising, if you look at the global economy, it doesn't make that big a difference. It goes from 80% OECD to 75% OECD. But almost all the population growth is in the developing world. Zero or slightly less than zero in the OECD. But they, OECD still dominates the, the economy. So um, the, uh, the two degree limit was set by the uh, IPCC. Um, that, that doesn't take into account the possibility that the tipping point is already at 1.5, so the whole thing just basically runs away. It, it only says that you know if you have a, a two degree uh, warming up, then you get this kind of disruption. But it doesn't tell anything about the dynamics. Am, am I correct about that? Yeah, you, you saw in that second of those burning embers diagrams that there was a non-zero risk that you would tip some of those big tipping points at two degrees. The, the only really thorough analysis I've seen it, that's been done by the Global Carbon Project, because they're worried about the big tipping points in the carbon cycle, that is, the, the methane outburst from the permafrost, um, the dieback of Amazon rainforest, they think that they're not going to be tipped at two degrees. They were pretty secure there. Um, we don't know about the ice sheets. There's, there's still debate about Greenland, for example. So, so if you allow me a second question. Yeah, sure. um, so I'm com I come from Europe, and I hate winters. So, so I'm a bit afraid of this, uh, this cooling down of Europe uh, due to the, the stopping of the, um, the uh, conveyor belt. But one, one, I mean, it, ha it happened before, right? In history, we know that, that oh, the yeah. conveyor belt stopped a couple of times. But at those times, the, um, you know, we, we were still within those boundaries, so to say. We were still within the, uh, the oscillating boundaries. 
No, we were, no th 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 those, th those flipped basically during the last ice age, not during the Holocene, although there was a flicker, that 8,000 year cool period during the <coughs> Holocene, uh, the early Holocene, yeah. was probably the last vestige of, of ice water being lost off Canada and it caused a flicker of that. Right, that but, but my point is this, that um, now we are off that scale completely um, uh, with much more CO2 in the atmosphere. So it could be that all of those processes basically come much faster than they went in, in when the previous time that it happened. Um, that can be bad news. That can be that you know we, we just have uh, a new ice age within 10 years, just to exaggerate it. For but it can also mean that um, you know when we get this fresh water going down because of the Greenland ice sheets melting and then the stopping of the um, conveyor belt and then the increase of ice coming from the north, that the albedo then increases so fast that we actually don't reach that area, that point anymore. No, th th that that. Um, dampening feedback doesn't occur to the extent that you, um, that you said. When you look at the models, what it does is, for most of Europe, it blunts the warming trend. In a few places right next to the North Atlantic, it actually gets a bit cooler. Most of Europe is still not cooler than it was pre-industrial. It's still a bit warmer, but the warming definitely slows down, and over the ocean, it's, it's rather cooler. So you don't get a big, um, a big change in the ice sheet. In fact, the Arctic becomes ice-free. Um, for other reasons. In fact, it's well on that track already. So you don't get that big feedback that you talked about. So you, you, you've, you've got two things happening. You've got the ocean circulation changing, which does affect its release of heat. But on the other hand, you've got other atmospheric processes that are warming. You're losing ice off Greenland. You're changing the albedo. It's warming. At the same time, the ocean current is dropping back. It's cooling. So when you look at those, in the, and the only way you can do that is put it in a model and see what happens. What you do is, is you get, in the worst case, you get the temperature of northern Europe dropping back to pre-industrial, okay? In the best case, yeah, in the best, in the best case, the, the warming is only a degree or so compared to three or four in the rest of the planet, okay? Yeah, um, I think, thank you for your really interesting, stimulating talks. Um, just wondering about, because basically the impression that I had from your talk was the, um, basically uh, talking about the activation of one to another, um, that says this climate change, then you probably another industrial development would trigger um, nitrogen and phosphorus cycle and so on. I'm just, because out of curiosity, I'm in sort of a <coughs> relations of inhibition to one another of those factors. And um, also, if, if you could also, this is a sort of second question that um, have you thought about it? Um, Think of robustness of each aspect that you put up on the article and put up on the picture that of the measures for Polish making. There was sort of a measures how you reflect the current situation, but I was kind of interested in to see the measures of robustness of this aspect. Okay, I'm I'm not quite sure. Of uh, your question. Uh, sorry, is, yeah. is, is, is that is that that graph uh, the picture? Yeah, I the graph. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Um, oh. But same sort of graph, but if you could visualize the robustness of each aspect that um, <coughs> each of those tipping elements. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Uh, have, have, have we um, overestimated how sensitive they are? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, because these sounded pretty fragile altogether. Well, that scenario was if you start triggering those. Now, I, I, sh I showed you just before I showed you all those things connecting a table with temperature ranges of where we think today those may be triggered. You saw some one to two degrees, some three to five degrees. So it depends on where you are. The scenario that's playing out where you see all of those triggered would be at the upper range of the IPCC projections. That's really, in a way, the mechanics by which the Earth may shift to another state. It's the sort of things that it may do as it starts changing. The reason people put that up there is they're concerned about them individually. Again, it's that um, siloed thinking in the, in the scientific community of people who look at ice sheets only think of ice sheets, people who look at um, modes of interannual variability only think about ENSO and maybe the Asian monsoon. Trustful ecologists think about the Amazon basin and so on. Nobody tries to connect them up. And we know when we go to the paleo record that they actually are connected. In fact, you see a wonderful, there have been some wonderful papers written about the connection, interestingly, between ENSO, El Nino, in fact, the, the Indian monsoon and the North Atlantic oscillation in terms of synchronous between the near failure of the, the new Australian colony in the 1780s, massive starvation in 
India, and the French Revolution. Those were co-synchronous co in time, were very close to it. And um, Richard Gross done some really nice work of then tracing back to how those, the linkages through the atmospheric circulation were, co were, were driving food problems in all, in all three areas. So there, there is some evidence in the past in the paleo science about linkages. And there's evidence that it actually affects human affairs, or it has in the past. So it isn't fanciful that the connections are there. The big uncertainty is where those, things, those dominoes might start fall, falling, and at what point they may stop falling if the connection isn't strong enough. And there we simply don't know. Is there any code between the tipping elements? Not, not that I'm aware of. I think that's something that John has talked about. Uh, I, I'll have to ask him whether he's published that or not. Um, you, you can find evidence for pieces of those linkages in papers around, but it's a good point. I'll press him to see if he's actually got that in the, in the literature. Thank you for, for the very nice talk. And uh, you had a you had a graph where there is a where there is a the, the red curve, which is going very high, and yeah. then it will change the economy in such a way that then we will be stable back to the. Uh, blue. To the, yeah, to the blue curve. Yeah, Whether um, there is uh, any estimation when the, there is uh, this curve, blue curve, will be very difficult to achieve already. I mean, this di dynamic will be already, um, let's say, highly unpredictable. I mean, but probably it will be very difficult for us to get back to the... Uh, is, is, this the curve, is this the curve you're talking about? Yeah, 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 exactly. Okay. I mean, whether there is any estimation when the, the blue curve will... Never, okay. never go back. I, I sort of skated over this too quickly. This top smaller panel are actually emissions. So it's measured in gigatons or billion tons of CO2. And the first bit here is actually what's been observed. So if you look at the time, we're at about 2012. So we're just at this bifurcation point. So basically the curve is saying we got basically two different futures we can move toward. Effective climate action would basically get a global scale um, during this decade would flatten out that curve and then come down towards zero at 2100. And if you actually take the air area under that curve, it comes out to be about 1,000 gigatons of CO2, a trillion tons. Now, that was predicated on having a reasonable chance of meeting the two-degree guardrail. It's a really nice paper that I encourage you to, to get by, by multi Mindshausen and colleagues from PIP 2009 in Nature. So what they said is, with effective policy, this is perhaps what we can do in terms of transforming energy systems and so on, and cap total global emissions at 1,000 gigatons. Now, that was from the year 2000. So we're in 2012. By 2010, we had consumed over 30% of that budget. So we're going too fast. Okay. Now, if we could keep our budget within that 1,000 gigatons, this is the temperature probability curve. So this blue corresponds to that blue. So if we can manage to do this, we have a good chance, three quarters chance, that we'll keep the temperature under the two degree. Okay, here's where we are now, we're up in here, approaching one. If we don't have any effective climate policy and simply let it go, just keep burning fossil fuel, coal, um, non-traditional oil, the oil shales up in Canada, and so on and so on, and keep burning those, and go up, burning towards 60 and 70 gigatons a year, which is feasible, then that's the temperature curve. Okay. So this was an introduction to, to then my next argument about the Earth as a system, is that we may have a shot of keeping a Holocene-like world here, but there's a, a risk that we will flip the Earth system into a new, perhaps longer-term stable state at a much higher temperature than what we're used to. Yeah, the question was whether it will be a stable state, or is it possible to estimate it Good, very good question. Uh, the answer is we don't know because um, people haven't been thinking this way and we don't have the modeling capability to actually test that. The best shot are so-called EMIX or system models of intermediate complexity, which uh, actually are the only models that can start simulating abrupt changes in the past. But I don't know of any modeling study that really sheds some light. All the ones I know of implicitly assume, in fact, it's built into the model, that even if you go up here, it'll even if you go up to this level here, it'll relax back down to the Holocene state in a couple thousand years. Um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, I have a question on the, on the Holocene uh, temperature record. 
why is it so unusually stable compared to the 100,000 years before? I mean, it, it looks like the Earth system somehow found some very tightly constrained feedback mechanisms that kept it there. And during that time, a lot of people have actually argued there was significant anthropogenic change. I mean, besides fossil fuels in the recent era, there was a lot of land use change previously, and a lot of people have argued that was actually a massive transformation for the past three, 4,000 years already. But there's no signal in, in the temperature record. So there's some, uh, is there any work on what exactly those feedbacks were? I mean, what's the dominant feedback that kept it there? I don't think anybody knows that for sure, but the interesting thing is, um, I should have shown you the Dome C ice core record, which actually goes back earlier than 400,000 years. About 600,000 years ago, we see a similar warm period. Now, if you look at that, um, let's see, no, no, it went the wrong way. Forget that. Uh, go right back to the front. Yeah. If you look at this, it's longer and slightly cooler than those three. And if you go back to 600,000 years ago, you get one that looks like this. And the, the answer is in the Earth's um, orbit around the sun, that it's an elliptical orbit. And these occur when, in the ellipse, it's closer to the sun. So it takes about 100,000 years to go around the sun. About every four or five of these orbits, the orbit's a bit more circular. So the Earth spends more time closer to the sun but it never gets that quite so close. So it's cooler by a degree or so, but it's longer. The last 600,000 year warm period was about 20 to 25,000 years long. And the people who study the astronomical theory of climate, it's called, tell us we have another 15 or 20,000 years of the Holocene if we don't mess it up. Yeah, well, ultimately, we've just been lucky, actually, with the Holocene. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> It's the sweet spot for humanity. It's the first of these long, warm periods when fully modern humans have been on the planet. Okay. So um, what, I'm curious your, your sense of the, the, the danger of nuclear fission. Um, it's been, uh, you know, Fukushima reminded us that it is dangerous business, uh, very, very bad for, 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 for DNA if you let the stuff loose. Um, but uh, this is certain. Uh, and it's pretty clear that if we burn fossil fuels, we get this. Yeah. Uh, is, how do you think about balancing those two risks? Yeah, look, that's, that, that's a debate that's being uh, had around the world, and it's being answered in different countries in different ways. France has already, for a long time, made its decision that it's going to run a lot of its electricity off nuclear. Um, there are debates in Germany, there are debates in Scandinavia about that. China, again, uh, needs all the energy you can get to keep bringing people out of poverty. So it's now the world leader in solar and wind, but it's also rolling out fourth generation nuclear and more coal fired power stations. So that's, it's made its decision, it needs everything. In Australia, we've had debates about this because we sit on about a third of the world's uranium supplies. And although we're willing to export it to countries that want to have fission power, um, we don't. For a lot of the arguments you made, we, we don't. Now there's arguments now because we're so coal intensive, well, wouldn't it be a good thing but I think our arguments now are moving toward wind and solar rather than the nuclear option. If we um, just look at it from a completely different point of view and say, OK, this is unstoppable. It's going to happen um, you know, with, with all the indicators that you just gave. Um, you know, even if we, we will not assume that we don't manage, then is there any research going on whether we can actually live in an anthropogenic uh, world that comes with such kinds of temperatures? I think there's a fair bit of denial going on. People don't want to do that. Don't want to do that. The only people I know, I know some epidemiologists uh, that are studying what it means for the human body to live in a, because it has never evolved. We haven't, we've never experienced anything like that. Uh, and so the question is, you know, we're, we're built to operate at 37 degrees Celsius. That's our body temperature. So um, our continent, where I live in North Africa, are the two places you can start to study that. Um, and you have big problems uh, when you get up above 40. We had a heat wave in Melbourne in 2009. Melbourne's actually a southern city, so in Australia, that's you know, arguably one of the cool, cooler places. And we had three or four days in a row of, of around 44, 45 degrees Celsius, and a lot of excess deaths. Um, the, the urban rail system fell over. The electricity system fell over. It wasn't designed for that. Um, so the human body can tolerate short periods of high temperature. We sweat. 
get evaporative cooling. But when your core body temperature goes much above 37, you pack up pretty quickly. So um, technology could bail us out. We could live in air-conditioned um, accommodation in workplaces and so on, which requires a lot of energy, by the way. Um, outdoor workers are the big um, problem. We've had some discussion between our unions and employers in Australia about uh, knocking off when days get much above 40 degrees and people are allowed to go home and, and get into air-conditioned rooms and so on. So it is an issue already. So it will change the way we live. It certainly changes the way uh, we won't go out on 40-some degree, degree days and do our summer exercise, that's for sure. Uh, so yes, it, 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 it's, it's a big issue. Uh, and I think human health will be the first one that will really get stuck into this, this issue. So I have a super easy question. You showed us a picture about the subsurface level ice on East Antarctica. Yeah. How do I know which part of Antarctica is east? Ah, OK. <laughs> they, they, yeah, they, 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 they define that as you radiate out from Antarctica. Uh, in fact, the, the Antarctic land claims are built on wet pie wedges or pizza slices starting from Antarctica. Antarctica going out toward various longitudes, okay? So basically the Australian territory, if you go out from that pie, encompasses Australia and so on. So then you start using the standard longitudes uh, of what's east and what's west of, of the zero longitude that goes through Greenwich, okay? So that's, so basically, think of it this way. Um, where we are now is in the, is called the east or the far east. It's the part of the world where, where I live in too. And that's basically East Antarctica is the Australian Antarctic Territory. We just think of it normally that way. That's how it's done. It's done in wedges coming out uh, from, from the pole itself. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, actually, there was a TED talk that was similar to what you just talked about, about tipping points. And um, I just don't exactly remember his name who gave this TED presentation that he mentioned that what's critical is that it is, it is for the humankind to change their mindset. And actually he mentioned a few examples that um, <coughs> change, um, this change of mindset comes from um, how we feel that it is now the situation really serious. Um, in that respect, um, what do you think how far has human mindset have at present change to the degree that it's going to really make effect? Yeah, that, that, that's, that, that's another really, I think, thought-provoking question. I've heard people argue that you've got to change values, mindsets, world perspectives, and then other things follow. I've had other people, behavioral scientists, say, yeah, sometimes, but sometimes you regulate first, and then values and mindsets change following that. A good example is uh, for example, the ban on smoking in pubs and restaurants and so on. I know, at least in Australia, there was an outcry. You'll kill the pub culture. You do this, you do that. Well, we regulated, and it didn't happen. Okay. Same thing with seatbelts in cars. A lot of people said, oh, no, this is personal freedom. You can't do this. Well, you regulated. You did it. And then attitudes change. So it can happen both ways, I think, with a, with a mindset through discussion and memes going out through society. Or it can happen simply that, that an institution, a governance system, says, all right, they just regulate. You won't do that. Uh, and then attitudes follow. I, I was actually really encouraged by, by Brian Arthur's talk because uh, of, of our capability of putting new pieces together, new modules together. And when you think about it that way, there's a cogent argument that all the pieces we need to go toward zero carbon and very close to zero carbon energy and produce it in reliable, sufficient amounts are actually there. They just need to be put together and then get through the governance system, which may be the biggest hurdle, as it often is. So sometimes I'm pretty optimistic that, and we, we've done this quickly, as, as Brian and I both said, the world we're living in now was vastly different than the world we were living in as children. And a lot of that, it's pretty hard to predict. But we at least know what direction we've got to go in now. How we actually do that, well, the cleverness and ingenuity may come to the fore. But I think the pieces are there to be put together. Building on that, uh, in the U.S., Is toxic politics and media uh, is, is keeping any action from occurring. And some recent uh, neuroscience and behavioral 
science indicated that when you give somebody who has a frame of reference opposed to the action, even though they presented better evidence, they actually, it will drive them further into their bias. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> assuming the Republican Party uh, locks in, as it has, to denying science, uh, how do you see a country like that getting out of it? Oh, geez, I don't know. <laughs> have to ask people who know U.S. politics better than I know U.S. politics. Um, we, have a, we, have a similar, we have a similar thing in Australia, and, and uh, um, I, I, I have really haven't been a student yet of how these big transformations occur in society. But there seems to be evidence in the past that, that there's been big opposition, and, it, and, it, and they really slow things down and stop things for a while. Eventually, it just becomes overwhelming and things change. I think it's going to be a lot of bottom-up stuff that changes. Yeah. Uh, like, like, you go around Australia, and you, we have a big denial community. We got right-wing media and right-wing politicians who try to model themselves after the Tea Party. They're amateurs when it comes to the Tea Party, but anyway. Uh, anyway, what, what, what you see in Australia now is a lot of on-the-ground action, uh, anywhere from a really emission-intensive uh, industry like silicon smelt smelters, which are worse than aluminium smelters. But the guy who runs our biggest smelter out in Western Australia is really keen on knocking his energy usage down as fast, recycling stuff, an amazing story. You know, we've whacked on a carbon price now, he isn't even worried because he already meets the emission reductions he has to do. And, and, it, and he doesn't care about the right-wing politics, he says I'm actually making money because I'm saving energy and all this stuff. So I can say all the science I want, people won't listen to it. He goes and talks to his mate in the aluminium smelter and says, hey listen, stop all this stupid opposition, you can make money doing this. You know, that's how things will start changing. We have the, have the last question, please. Yeah, thank you. This is, this is less a question than a comment on, on that last point. Um, it's pretty clear that the, the evidence shows that if you want to overcome that kind of deep-rooted opposition, you don't present people with evidence on the problem, you yeah. present them with evidence on the solution, which yeah. I think is exactly what you were just saying. The science community is never gonna convince anybody who isn't already convinced. It's just going to provide ammunition when you're talking about political battles. What you can do is provide evidence for this is a way out of the problem that science has proven is taking place. Yeah, I'll just make a final comment. It's ex absolutely right. Um, I'm on a thing called the Climate Commission in Australia, which is a, a group of six people who go around the country engaging people in the cities in, in regional Australia. Two of us are scientists, uh, but the rest are not. And we're in our second year, and we've been gathering these vignettes or stories of people who are changing and why they're changing. And that's a big part of how we communicate. Not me talking about science and so on, but hey, look what this farmer's doing. He's storing carbon. He managed the drought better. He was able to keep more sheep on the land. And then he goes and talks to his neighbors and so on. So you're absolutely right. I think that's, that's the way to go. Okay. So let us uh, thank Professor Thompson for his wonderful talk. And I would like to present uh, this book of position to Professor. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>